Han är nyss fyllda 40. Medelklassunge från Brixton i England. Han har hållit sig på topp i 20 år nu i rockbranschen och verkar bara bli större. Varför? Ja, det är något med honom som folk vill härma. Han är en inspiratör och trendsätter som det heter. Inte bara för ungdomar utan också för andra artister. Han var också en av de första som började leka med ljud och bild. Rockvideos. De ska vi visa. Och så var han så mystisk för att inte säga mytisk förut. Han bytte skepnad och namn och sexuell identitet så folk visste varken ut eller in. Men nu är han rockstjärna och en ovanligt skärp typ. I lördags var han här i Stockholm. I don't have to put up with superficial or artificial things anymore. <coughs> oh, please oh, excuse me. Um, because I am of the grand age where I can just do what I want and I don't want to have things like entourages. I don't want to live like a Michael Jackson or a Prince or something mm -hmm. like that. I just want to be able to be anonymous when I want to be and go out to a cinema or a theatre. Bless you. And or I, if I want to make something public about what I'm doing, then I have the facility to... Uh, to do it. To do it, yeah. yeah. And I can come to town and say, here I am, I have a tour. I can have television cameras come and I can t call the press in and say, I'm having a tour this year, this is what it's going to be like. But if I wanted to come back to Stockholm and nobody knows I was here, it's no problem. You can do it. I get any... How do, do you do it? Because if I don't want to be recognized, I don't have to be recognized. Mm. It's very easy to live like that. Yeah. I always feel very sorry. Yeah for people who become entrapped in uh, yeah. like an ivory tower situation. Yeah. How, but how do you do? Do you dress in a strange way? Yeah, a strange way. Yeah. <laughs> I do the reverse. I yeah. dress in a very anonymous way. Yeah. But your looks are very well, typically bowish, I would say. I, it's, but you know, people are very nice. People yeah. are lovely. And when I go out, if I am recognized at a club or something, mm. it's just, oh, hi, I didn't, you know, you're here, that kind of thing. I mean, it's not a, it's not a big deal. Yeah. It's very easy for me to do that. Det är en 
Bowie. He's from my name, it's the same. Oh, you don't. Now you're going to be a David Bowie är en utomordentligt skicklig marknadsförare. Den har visat många gånger och på presskonferensen i lördag så visade han det än en gång. Då bjöd han in 400 nordiska journalister på en exklusiv konsert. Och sen, när alla var lagom möra efter den rockupplevelsen, då började presskonferensen. Ja. I'm sorry? For how long are you going to continue with pop music? <laughs> this is a defiant question. For how long do you intend to continue with pop music? Um, <laughs> uh, it's difficult to say, you know, man, because um, you look at somebody like Chuck Berry and the guy still works and he still works very well. If you see him on stage with, say, Keith in the new <coughs> film that's been done about him, the guy is just dynamite. One hopes that one just should do what you want to do until you know that it just doesn't mean anything anymore. For me, it's still very exciting to write albums. It's still very exciting to do stage work and do performance. Um, and, and when that fascination and that enjoyment goes, then I will, I promise you, I definitely will stop then. Oh, by the way, there were four kids here who were out there in the snow waiting for their tickets. Are they here? Are you over there? Have you got any questions, you four, before we split? I've, I've asked these people. Will I play any of the album? Early songs, one on the tour? Absolutely. Oh, definitely. You'll get a fair selection. But right now we're going to play Die In, Die Out. <laughs> David Bowie i topp humör. Han har lite impact så där och liksom han, det är ändå inte vem som helst som står där liksom. Man, man har fullt på liksom hänga med. Jag har inte smält det här. Were you always able to do exactly what you wanted to do, what you felt was fun to do, or did you have in some times of your career up that until, you had to up compromise until 76, a lot? Um, I, I think that I was all over the place. I never took over what I really wanted to do until 1976, beginning of 77. And since then, I left Los Angeles where I had a very bad life and I was uh, very involved in drugs and had a lot of problems there and was living in a sort of a world of cocaine. And I left that in 76, 77. And from that period onwards, it's been a question of rebalancing and reevaluating my life. So I feel now, since 77 onwards, things are more or less what I've wanted them to be like, mm -hmm. with the added luxury of having a, a huge record in 83, which I didn't expect because up until, uh, up until 83, I'd always had a medium-sized audience. I was like a, a large cult figure in mm -hmm. terms of I had a regular audience of about between five and 10,000. And that was where it was at for me. And that, I was very happy with that. And I thought, well, that's my position in rock and roll. Mm. And I'm very happy mm. with that. I've been like that for 12, 13 years. And great, wonderful, that I'm still able to work. And then suddenly with Let's Dance, everything exploded. Um, the new single seems to be a disco song, but underneath the lyrics seem to have uh, a different kind of, a much heavier social text. Um, basically, the... <laughs> I was picking up on what was happening in uh, America on, uh, through the media in terms of the underprivileged and the homeless and I wanted to make a more direct statement uh, about that situation. And all the people who were acting in this video are homeless people from Los Angeles. That's who we worked with. And they form, but these particular homeless people form themselves into a theatre group so that they could become more vocal about their situation on the streets. And uh, I, was so, I saw their production in, in, in L.A. They have a little um, house there where they put on their performances for anybody who wants to come and see them. They're called Skid Row Theatre. And it is, it's uh, fascinating. It's, uh, they put their problems forward in songs and little review and little situations and, and monologues. And they all contribute. There's about 20 to 30 of them. Transient, because of the, they are a transient group. And they come in and out and, and project their problems like that. And I wanted to work with them very much, so I worked with them. And the police in this video are the Los Angeles police. And there's a very strong possibility that I'll be doing a movie with Mick Jagger next year. 
No, it's not Summer Like It Hot. That was a joke that uh, I would guess one of us put out, but became past a joke. <laughs> no, it's not the film we're doing. We're having something, we, we started writing something together, and now a screenwriter is working on, on it with us, and uh, it's a story of our own devising. And it's, uh, it's quite strange and off the wall, and I think very interesting. From where do you get all the energy? I've always had an abundance of energy. I've been a very athletic, fit kind of person. Mm -hmm. I, I, I live a very conservative life in that way. My, um, I'm an early riser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I tend not to go out very much to clubs. I'm not a clubber. Mm -hmm. um, I much prefer to go to the theatre or the cinema or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I'll go and see new bands. But I'm not much of one for sitting and listening to disco. But to me, it's almost a coincidence that you're a rock star. Couldn't you be a poet or an artist just as well? A painter? Every rock star has pretensions of being a poet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so one considers that I play with words in a way that a poet would play with words. Mm -hmm. But um, I was trained to be a painter, but I wasn't a very good painter. So, Like most English art school students, you would take two things to art school. You'd take a portfolio with your paintings mm -hmm. and you'd take a guitar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and within the first few months, you'd know which one you were better at. Mm -hmm. And I opted mm -hmm. for the guitar. Is Actually, in my case, it was a tenor sax. Are you brave enough to tell your son everything that you've been through? My son knows everything I've been through. Yes, always. already. Well, we've had a relationship. I mean, I took custody of him in uh, the middle 70s, mm -hmm. um, which, as you probably know, is very unusual for a father to obtain custody, which probably says a lot about my ex-wife. Mm -hmm. However, he and I... Maybe more about you. No, uh, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. He and I have, uh, have had a very strong, close relationship mm -hmm. since that time. And uh, I think now he's nearly 16. It's almost the relationship of uh, two brothers. Because mm -hmm. I try and keep aware, because I have a genuine interest in the things that he's interested mm -hmm. in, and the music that he's interested in, the sports that he wants to play, the mm -hmm. things that he wants to do in life. So one naturally gravitates towards those things and learns about them, as well as him. So mm -hmm. in the process of me sort of taking him over completely, um, I've grown up as much as he's grown up. Hopefully I've grown up a bit faster, because I've got to be a bit, <laughs> a bit further there. Yeah. But uh, it's, um, it's it's been the most rewarding thing for me and probably the most fulfilling thing in my life. But did you actually tell him, you mean, about all the things you went through in the 70s in Los Angeles with drugs and sex? Oh, yes, he knows all about those things. Yes. Yeah. Well, at what age? Because I wonder myself, where can I tell him? Only over the from? last two... Th well, what, what uh, <laughs> sex problems have you had in the last few years? <laughs> tell me about Not them. about sex problems, <laughs> but I mean... Or drugs when, when, and things that you've, yes. you've done. And I'm sure I can find the books. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I, I, I wonder, at what age did you start to be quite honest with him? I've been honest with him as the questions arrive. Mm -hmm. And obviously he reads all kinds of uh, rubbish, so he kind of, you know, comes back to me and yeah. I, I talk with him. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But fortunately, I mean, he knows all the people in my life. He knows my friends and he knows what they think of me. Mm -hmm. And I think he doesn't know any of the people that sort of write the, the books and things because mm -hmm. they're never... Uh, the ones that I, I think there are 30 seven books on me and they're all very close intimate friends right <laughs> and they're, they're, they're people that have uh, that have always been a periphery around me and genuinely what i found is that the people who concentrate on being very malicious about a personality as far as it's applied to me have been people that have joined my uh, group of workers with the idea of having a high life getting stoned a lot have getting a lot of money and having a great coast ride for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And when they find out that I don't want that, that I want people who work hard, they get very disillusioned and very bitter. And it's a that's, revenge. It's a revenge. And it keeps them, it gives them a bit of fame. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think constantly throughout the books, it's the same group of 12 or 14 people mm -hmm. who are in there. And they're becoming, they're getting their fame and they're getting, and they, each book that comes out, they have to say something more outrageous than the last book if they're still going to be a big, big name, mm -hmm. you know. So it kind of works in that fashion. What? But Joe knows all my friends. Yeah. And so he knows what my life's like and he knows what my friends are like. Yeah. And my friends I would never mention because I would not like them to become the brunt of that kind of publicity. I understand. When are you writing your own book? Never. Are you quite sure about that? Absolutely. Yeah? I have absolutely no interest in it. Mm -hmm. When you look back at uh, the time in Berlin, yeah. 
What did Berlin, it, it, it actually helped you a lot, I think, after the hard oh, period. Oh, sure it was. It was like going back into some kind of, after the, um, after the war, that Berlin became devoid of any industry. All the industry moved back into West Germany. So what was left when I got to Berlin were factories which had been taken over by painters and musicians, mm -hmm. and it had turned almost into this colossal workshop. So for me, it was an incredibly musically and artistically stimulating place to be in. Um, and also, uh, people there, again, in, in Berlin, are very blasé about celebrity status. So mm -hmm. it's a very easy city to live in if, if you have any kind of celebrity or notoriety or infamy or, or fame or whatever it is one attaches to a public figure. Los Angeles in Berlin seems to me the, the, the very, very extreme... Yeah. Yeah, that was that was that was uh, that was indeed what I was striving to find. It was uh, an important song for me. Um, I, I, the the element of it. We were recording in a studio, which was very near the wall. I've been there. I know where it is. Yeah, you know that studio, do you? Right by. Yeah, the absolutely. Door. And there's a turret literally mm -hmm. opposite the window. And every day when we finished our music, we used to open the windows and play it to the soldiers in the turret and see what they thought of it. And they would go <laughs> like that. Um, and one day I saw a couple walking by the wall that obviously used to meet there at lunchtime or something. And it's just the image of those two people having their romance by this grey, anonymous wall and the guard turrets. And it, it just struck me as being a pertinent incident in, 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 the in the 70s at that time when I wrote it. And of course, carried through to the 80s. It seemed to be very much of a nowness to it. But you don't feel any need for building now? No, no, I outlived it. Yes. You have turned 40 now, but yeah. still, still you look, look 20 in, in your latest video. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do I dare repeat that? Um, I, I'm, I've passed 40 now, but I still look how old? 20. 20? Hear that again, please? <laughs> I still look 20 in my new video. How is this, please? <laughs> um, I think that's a very flattering remark, and I'm not quite sure how to reply to that one. Um, I'll think about that. Then you went to Bali, uh, Java, yeah. Singapore. What yeah. were your impressions? It was um, the Bangkok concert in, in uh, Thailand which was the very last one that we did there, was absolutely extraordinary because it was, it was on the king's birthday. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were singing kick and happy birthday to the king. It was the mm -hmm. most incredible thing. And the one thing I remember more than anything else about it, other than Thailand itself, which I adore, and I'm mm -hmm. traveling down to the coast and through the, and through the north, through the jungles mm -hmm. there, it's beautiful. But going to the gig, the car broke down, so we ended up hitchhiking to the show. <laughs> Yeah. And um, we got a taxi ride and the police wouldn't let me in because they didn't think I yeah, couldn't get in. True. It took oh. me about a quarter of an hour to get into the show because uh -huh. I oh. had no ticket. But in the Buddhist oriented countries there's a kind of calmness throughout them. In Thailand there's an incredible calmness among the people mm -hmm. that I think um, will be something for the West to learn from. Mm -hmm. Have you learned from it? I was a Buddhist for 15 minutes when I was a teenager. <laughs> like every teenager. Meditating. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think from the, and uh, and that experience stayed with me. I think uh, as if one can develop a philosophy, I think the the idea of uh, nothing manifest can be can last. That, that everything is very transient. Mm -hmm. It's not worth holding on to anything. Mm -hmm. What are you looking? At? Um, is, is seeing if you're having a crucifix. Oh yes, I do have a crucifix. Yeah, you yeah, do. The, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Buddhists are not supposed to have crucifix. No, this one wears one. This one. <laughs> this one attaches a lot of uh, personal feelings to. There was something was given to me by my. Mm -hmm family many years ago. I've always wanted. I don't know why. Am I going to marry again? Um, no, it's not uh, in my mind to marry. Thank you for asking me, madam. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Never let me down. The title of the album is Never Let Me Down. Is that because I'm afraid of people letting me down? No, the uh, title song is written for a very close friend of mine. And uh, it was just, it's a reciprocal song. If you finish the lyric, it also says, I'll never let you down. So it's a, it was a song of loyalty and of, of, uh, of love some, for somebody. And because it's a fairly intimate statement, I thought that would be uh, a good overall statement for the album in general.
I'm sorry? It's a song for, uh, what, who's it for? The song is for Coco Schwab, who's been my personal assistant for nearly 15 years. Sorry? Are you the marriage girl? <laughs> Am I going to marry her? It's not a romantic relationship. She's been my best friend for 15 years. I have another girlfriend. Who's that? I'm not telling you. <laughs> in, the, in the 60s, it, the popular music went very much hand in hand with the civil rights movement and it changed people's awareness of the black situation. Mm -hmm. Later on, it, it, it did the same kind of refocusing or contributed to the refocusing on the Vietnam War. And in the punk explosion in the 70s, that, that, it, that really changed people, so really focused in on the economic depression that was uh, current in Europe at the time. And then Live Aid came along and suddenly people's attention was switched to the plight of the African nations. Now it can never solve any problems, but rock music can certainly reactivate interest in certain areas. And, and, and it was because of Bob's work that I think uh, made a lot of us artists realize that we can fundamentally strive to do something with our music other than create impressions or atmospheres. Um, I think that the nature of rock is changing in such a way that it can still provoke interest by things like the Bob Geldof event, the Live Aid event. But even that is changing now. There are so many things like that that the attention is less and less. Mm -hmm. So something else will happen. Mm -hmm. But that, it's always that undergoing one. change. Yes. That's the one thing. It won't stagnate because there's too much young blood <clears throat> that comes into rock. Every, every few years, young blood comes in and revitalizes it. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it exciting. <laughs> Och nästa vecka, då blir det så här. Och nu är det slut, så jag säger bara hej hej, hemskt mycket hej.